teacher then soon after reading of the message proposed to put in activity all classes of conscripts and to raise alone 100 millions for the expenses of the war. Francois de Nantes presented the project of an address to the French, always unanimously approved of the Commission of Eleven, was declared dissolved. During the sitting, the Council of Ancients confirmed all our resolutions. The permanence of the legislative body was terminated and all re-entered into constitutional order. Such was the revolution of the 30th Prairie Royale. It had some resemblance with that of 1830. Both of them had the same result of violently changing the executive power. Both one and the other were accomplished by the legislative body. Neither one nor the other was submitted to the universal voting. They had nevertheless the general consent. The resignations were given by the directors equally as freely as those of Charles D. and Duke d'Angoulême. In short, the resignation of the directory as well as that of the elder branch of the Bourbons was incomplete. One of the five directors did not renounce and one of the princes of the elder branch did not renounce. He could not because he was a minor. But these resemblances are accompanied by differences more remarkable, which we will examine hereafter by comparing the revolution of Brumaire with all those which we have had proceed and succeeded during half a century. What are we to conclude in the meantime from these resemblances that we have remarked? First, that the 30th Prairie Real and the 30th of July have produced two governments without a positive right because they were not confirmed by the free and universal voting of the nation for which no right, whatever, can make up the deficiency entirely second. The directory elected on the 30th of Prairie Real, not having known how to preserve its power of de facto and not having the right its fall upon the 18th brute mayor was legitimate even before three millions of votes had approved of it third his majesty the king of the french can and ought to terminate the revolution of july by the free and universal vote of the nation he can for he reigns in peace and with undisputed approbation he ought for that popular consideration would fortify his throne. It would be as useful to his family as to France. It would cleanse the great nation from the affront of not having been consulted upon the change of her dynasty. For if since 1830 and notwithstanding the excessive rigors, the present government has merited the praises of every impartial man for having known how to preserve internal and external peace, it is not the the loss evident to every eye that at this moment the French throne is not yet seated, but between the quasi legitimacy of divine right and the quasi legitimacy of the popular right, its power has not been consecrated either by the elevation upon the shield which was the universal suffrage of ancient France, or by the hereditary coronation, the legitimacy of past times, or by the national vote the legitimacy of new times. If immediately after the 30th of July, they receded before a universal voting, that is explained by reasons that our contemporaries know and which are useless to mention. But at this time, after five years of exterior peace and material amelioration, now that the factions are vanquished or rendered powerless, what is there to fear in legitimating? Is France descended so low that they may always dispense with her vote? If the new government of our fine country would at length submit itself to popular voting, it would confirm the strength of itself, and all would then surround with conviction the elect of the people. If, on the contrary, he refuses to render homage to that sovereign whom in our age it is vain to disown. I wish to deceive myself, but the abyss of a revolution is inevitably about to open before us, and the counselors of the crown who do not endeavor to engage it to bond before that popular sovereignty assume upon their own heads all the responsibility, the struggles which threaten every government that is ill seated to persist in not consulting France would be showing that they do not regard the 30th of July as a revolution but as a 
personal catastrophe. Either the three days are really glorious because they overturned the government a divine right to raise in its place a government a popular right because for a charter granted by the king, they have substituted a charter consented to by the king and proposed by the legislative chambers. The ordinances were only the occasion of that revolution of principles and to make it complete, it should be sanctioned by the sovereign people, whose power it acknowledged in raising the banner of 1789 and 1781 of the Republic, of the Consulate, and of the Empire, in expressing myself thus without any reserve and saying all that I think upon the actual constitution of my beloved country. They would perhaps ask me how, with that decided opinion, I insist without ceasing upon my re-entry in France. How can I demand to live under the charter which created the throne of the king of the French? My answers will be as frank as my faith in the absolute sovereignty of the universal voting is decided and profound. I desire to re-enter France as a citizen subject to the actual laws of my country because those laws such as they have been made by the legislative assemblies, although not sanctioned by the popular baptism, offer nevertheless a social state which, without being perfect, appears to me to be preferable to many others, and above all preferable to exile because the present royal government created and sustained by the unanimous suffrages of several legislative chambers possesses in consequence the votes of 200,000 electors who have at this moment in France a legal privilege of political right because that state of things which is neither the best nor the worst if agreeable to the French people as is demonstrated by the numerous adhesions and tacit consent of all it does not belong to a simple citizen to refuse obedience to the laws which his country approves of or finds suitable but that obedience does not carry with it the conviction that those laws are infested with popular legitimacy it is not obliged one to believe that the vote of the deputies of 200,000 electors 200,000 electors is equal to the vote of several millions of citizens. It is not in the least prevent them from desiring that the universal suffrage of which those laws are deficient should be given to them. Let them no longer delay that national sanction. It would, on the contrary, be showing that they sincerely desire the confirmation and the amelioration of those laws of the country beneath whose ages they desire at least to take shelter. And certainly irrational faith, ardent and exclusive, and the popular sovereignty for by the suffrage of all may be expressed without temerity by him who, excluded from the empire by that same universal suffrage, acknowledged and revered in former days that supreme power which threw him out of his family as he acknowledges it at this moment, while he regrets that the sacred dogma is still wanting to the government of his country.